would have in the expectations and the kind of criteria they might use for making decisions looking into the future. Declan, go ahead. Here's Brian. So, um, yeah, I presume I'm on mute. I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, so basically, I said I would go through uh, where we are now in terms of gene therapy. Quick overview of the of the agenda. Um, so, what is gene therapy? Uh, I, th I think there's a very different uh, group of people involved. Um, where we are today, how to deal with some of the uncertainties, or what were the main uncertainties, which is slightly different to the way Brian will approach it. Um, what are the expectations? I will leave up to Brian. And where is it is it going? So I want to start off because sometimes we don't really. Um, to me, it, it helps me understand uh, the way gene therapy works if I know the way a, a virus works. So what we have here in the, in the top left hand corner, and I have a pen, so I'll be able to do fancy stuff that Brian won't be able to do. So in terms of the top left hand corner, we have what's a, a regular virus, which is your flu. It does, it's a adeno associated virus, and it's the eighth type. Um, it doesn't really cause any major issues, but what happens is it gets through the skin or the bo or whatever barrier it may be in the mouth and the nose. Um, it gets into the body, and it's aim is to find the right cell. So once it gets into the body, it starts to target the right cell. And the AV8, what it does mostly is targets um, the liver cell. Once it gets to the, once it gets into the body and gets to the cell, it releases into the cell a, which is this section here, um, a, a reconstruction plan or, or DNA asking the nucleus of the cell, the center of the cell or the manufacturing uh, planner, to create or construct new uh, virus using the building blocks from within the cell itself. So they're amin amino acids. Once it does that, it releases it to infect new cells and um, then it just goes wild. And basically once it goes into it, so it leaves, it leaves here and then goes into a new cell. These go off to find different cells um, and this replication starts again. And you repeat, the, the aim of the virus is to repeat as much as possible until the viral stress or the stress on the cell uh, destroys the, the, the cell itself or the body starts to put up a defense. So the body- Sorry Declan, one second. Yeah. Just somebody on chat said they have no sound. Can we just do a sound check? Are people hearing Declan okay? Yeah, no problem yeah, here. Fine, here. Yes. Yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay Declan, okay. carry on, sorry. Okay. so. The virus goes, uh, tries to repeat as much as possible. Now, effectively, if this goes on without the body responding, the viral stress will kill the cell and um, it could be an issue. But the body generally responds. So the first line of response is called an innate immunity. Um, and, and that's basically the big guns. They detect and destroy the manufacturing sites. And in this case, the manufacturing sites are the, are the uh, infected cells. So straight in, uh, destroy the cells. Then you have this second uh, level of attack, which is the acquired response, or second level of defense. So it's effectively a crack team. I, I like to think of it as a SWAT team. Um, and it is, these are the antibodies, and they prevent reinfection. They attach to the virus uh, itself and kills the virus, or stops the virus from, from uh, entering into the cell and therefore killing the virus. So, they, so inside the body, there's no more virus. We still have these, um, these antibodies floating around to, pretend to, to prevent the uh, adeno-associated virus eight coming back in again. So they hang around and, and we're no longer effective from the, the AV8. Now we have gene therapy. So in terms of gene therapy, this in this, in this top left-hand corner again is that AAV8 virus. Um, what, what gene therapy does is they take the outside bit and clean out the inside. So there's nothing in here. This is what's called an AAV8 capsid. They leave it empty and they put inside that, uh, what's the little green thing is called a promoter. And the, this is the factor DNA. Now, we picked the AAV8 because it targets the right cells. So it, it is already targeted to go towards the liver, so that's where we want it to work, so that's what we pick the AAV8. 
But if you use an AAV8 and you put that into the body, the antibodies that are there will lock, lock onto that capsid and stop it from um, doing its job. So that's called AAV, or that's called immunity, and it's specifically to AAV8. So how do we get around that? We can use a different type of capsid, an AAV5 capsid. So will the antibodies um, stick to that? Uh, because it's a different capsid. Um, there's two, five, eight, they, they go on. If the antibody sticks to it, it's referred to as what's called cross-reactivity. Um, and you can see here, the Y um, attaches to that capsid, but not as many as to this eight. So maybe that one uh, location will, will cause a problem, maybe it won't, um, and you might actually be able to um, deliver the gene therapy without worrying too much about um, the antibodies to AAV8 within the, in the person's uh, body, um, and you may have less uh, reactivity. The other thing that, that is an option is something called codon optimization. Um, and that's effectively, we have this little, uh, the antibody attached to this location. So we, we switch out that location for something that does not look like that functionally works. Um, and then it can be given into the body. So that's, that's effectively codon optimization. But we still have one or two, well, we have many issues, but one, the next issue then is the, the viral vector um, as I showed earlier on, doesn't replicate like the um, like the like a virus. It can only infect once, so you have to try and hit as many cells as possible before the body responds, and that's referred to as the as the vector dose. And uh, all these are kind of important concepts when we start to look at the issues that are coming up in relation to gene therapy and what the impact is. So now we have this viral vector. We've we've chosen the one that we want. Um, we've put the the DNA inside that we want. We have the promoter that we want, and uh, we don't have um, any uh, specific antibodies as such. But what we need to do at that point is to inject a, a high enough initial dose, um, enough for efficacy to happen, but low enough to minimize the immune response. And that's very different for different people from what we've seen in the clinical trials. The other thing that we've seen in clinical uh, trials are from company to company, is the use of empty capsids. And if you can think of them as decoys um, to overload the antibodies, effectively, effectively what that does is you're hoping that um, the antibodies attach onto the decoys and enough vector gets through to the cell that is producing it to create a response. Now, this is vastly oversimplified because I know a couple of you guys are on the, on the call um, are, are way higher than this. I'm very simple. So this is kind of how it works in my head. In terms of the next thing that we can do is we can change the DNA to be more efficient. So you, you effectively have the same amount of DNA, but a much higher expression. And that's called the DNA optimization. So what we, what we see in factor nine in particular is we have a wild type, which is kind of what everybody has versus a Padua. So you get a much higher expression for the same amount using the Padua than for uh, the wild type. So back to, our, back to our cells. So we have it in the body. We, we've gotten over the antibody issue. It goes into the cell. It does exactly the same thing. But on the right-hand side, instead of virus coming out, proteins come out. Now, what we have it, that is different from a virus is it only infects the cells once and it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't affect others after that or shouldn't. Um, it's still an infected cell. So it, it's still potentially a difference in the body from your normal cell. So your immune system might respond and that's something that we have to get over. Still causes a, a stress on the cell to produce the protein which can result in, in, in cell death um, it, over, over a longer period of time. But when the, also when the cell replicates, it shouldn't bring the, the new DNA with it using an AAV uh, capsule, and that's called non-integration. But basically what we have seen in terms of, um, of the gene therapies is we've, we've had a couple of um, responses in terms of that immune response. So the solution is to slow down the immune response until enough cells are infected or, or um, targeted. And that's 
use either steroids or immunosuppressants. Um, we have a loss of production in some cases uh, of factor, um, which is not as quick as we expected. So this is an AAV is a non-integrating uh, virus, but there's clearly something happening in terms of when the cells are replicating, some of the DNA has been transferred, uh, and that would go to integration. In terms of um, cell stress, one of the things that has been postulated is the more stress, the shorter the lifespan of the cell, and therefore there might be um, a, a drop in expression. And I'll come back to, I'll, I'll point it out later on. So where are we today? We have, we have over nine um, clinical trials in terms of gene therapy. Um, Roctavian is the one that's closest to market from Biomarin that, that could be on the market this year. Um, the other ones that are going into phase um, three very, very shortly, they started at the introduction period, is the Sangamo one from, uh, that is now Pfizer, and the Spark one. Bayer is currently um, still assessing their, their, their levels of treatment. This one is the newest kid on the block. We're not quite sure what happened. This one is very interesting. I'll come back to that one later on. And the Spark 8016 is indicated for, or is primarily for um, people with inhibitors. And they're starting out with a history of inhibitors in, in the first part of the trial, at least. In terms of factor nine, um, Pfizer and uh, Unicure is, is in phase three. Pfizer is just starting uh, phase three. Um, AMT60 is basically the older version of, or AMT60 is the older version of AMT61. Um, and that is also interesting. I'll come back to that in a little while for maybe for rare bleeding disorders, which could be interesting uh, in terms of that decision. And then uh, the rest of them are, are following on um, quite nicely and, and, and progressing really interestingly. So in terms of the uncertainties and the unknowns, um, reliability, um, durability, variability, safety, and activity are the key things. And I think um, it is how likely you are to respond, how long will it last, um, what level will you achieve, what are the unknowns, and what are the knowns, or what are the known unknowns, or what are the unknown unknowns, and also in terms of the activity level, what does that level actually mean? So first question in terms of reliability, how quick, how likely am I to respond uh, post-infusion? So in terms of factor eight or factor nine, when you produce it in a lab, you have a bioreactor that tries to mimic the, the, the components that are required for cells to live. Um, and there's usually about 300 controlled, well-controlled variables to make that happen. If you now think of your liver as a, as a human uh, bioreactor, we have very little control over it and we have no idea how many variables are going on um, in terms of reliability. So what we've seen in clinical trials around phase one, uh, early dosing of phase, two of, uh, phase one, two, um, and even some of the other ones, we've had scenarios where there's been no response to the, to the, uh, uh, the vector to a complete response to the vector where there's been, um, everybody has responded. The problem with that is there's, it comes from relatively small uh, numbers. There's a lot of clinical learning going on and the intervention with the use of steroids can change the response and the outcome. And therefore somebody who has no response in a, in a, a really early part of the trial might've actually uh, had a response if uh, steroids were used or something else was used. Um, so for me, it's not useful in terms of decision making until we see a bit more data from, from, from the phase three uh, trials uh, when they come to light. And that plays a big part in terms of decision making. In terms of durability, um, the factor nine durability is, is very interesting. So this is the graphs from the initial proof of concept. Does gene therapy work uh, back in 2011? Um, and that showed um, that 10 years on, it's almost 11 years on now, um, that patients who receive gene therapy have the same levels of expression. The other factor nine uh, durability, which is that AMT060, is uh, effectively demonstrating the same effect. So three years on, uh, or over three years on, 
there has been no loss of uh, factor activity level. So you're still maintaining the same levels in terms of, of treatment. Then we have the factor eight durability. Um, and that is something where we have seen a loss in factor uh, expression over time. So in terms of, we have four year data now, we, we've continually um, seen, seen factor levels um, decrease. And you can see here from the graph on the right hand side, this one up here, that uh, the graph is slowly decreasing. But what we don't know is what is impacting the rate of um, decrease and, and what are the issues. So is one individual could go down like this, another individual could go down like this, another individual could go, well, not necessarily up, but um, could go at different uh, angles, which is a little bit um, confusing from this graph. And it's something we don't have a lot of information on. Um, this uh, treatment did have to use quite a lot of steroids at the initial part, so there is um, some variability there at the, end, at the beginning. But if we think about what, what is happening in this in comparison to the factor nine, it's slightly different. Um, and one thing that, that came up at WFH and ISTH this year is this concept of cellular stress, um, which I, I think is quite, is quite an interesting point. So factor nine targets a liver cell called a pathocyte, and that creates uh, factor nine. Now, if you have a normal expression, factor nine comes from the pathocytes. But if you have a factor eight, it comes normally from a different location. So, so forcing it or asking it to produce a lot of factor eight puts a lot of stress on the cell. And that may be the reason for, for the, uh, the, the, the loss over time. Now, the question then becomes, if there is that loss over time, will it start to plateau? And I could, personally, I couldn't figure out why, why that question was being asked when there was clearly a decline, but possibly you get to a point where the stress on the cell isn't as much and therefore it starts producing the factor eight on its own uh, or without too much stress and you get this kind of slower plateau towards the end. The other thing is, it, could, could it be the vector itself? Could it be just um, something uh, that is that caps that I mentioned earlier? And there's very little information on that that we can really say because again data is very very early um, and we'd have to see a lot more people treated with different vectors um, to really say that it is a vector itself or it's something else but i think that's a really interesting point in terms of variability so these are some of the these uh, ones that reported in in the last couple of uh, weeks in, in wh and isth and on the right hand side, I think that's the bit that for me is the most interesting. So the, in the same level of cohorts so and in, in the same dose between the person who got the lowest response in that dose and the person who got the highest response in that to dose, in the original St. Jude trial, that's about four times. But effectively, that's from 2% to about 8%. So really, potentially not a, a significant, uh, significant, significant issue. Four, it's about four times um, a difference. And once you start to move up, so the Spark 9, the uh, AMT 61 uh, from Unicure, the, the Freeline, um, they're all showing quite a large number of differences uh, from the lower dose to the higher dose. But if the average now is, if you're talking the difference between, um, say, 30% uh, and 200%, that's a big, big difference. And that's a lot of variability that, that we see in terms of the trials. Um, and it's the same in the factor eight. There is, there is a lot of uh, variation. For example, the high dose factor nine, or sorry, high dose factor eight level uh, is about 10 times difference in, the, in the, uh, the response that people had between the highest dose and the lowest dose. In terms of safety and, and, and uh, on terms of uh, short-term steroids, um, or in short term, and we'll kind of look at the steroids. So in terms of the, this participant, number seven, steroids were for a fairly short period of time uh, and, and tapered off quite quickly. Number eight was a little bit longer, um, and number 11, uh, patient number 11 was okay. I haven't told you what um, trial this comes from. Um, it is the spark, but it doesn't particularly matter. 
uh, in terms of the response because we see something similar at different levels across different um, uh, trials. Now, that's okay for a short period of, of time if the anticipation for the clinical trials are, are, are or uh, uh, the anticipation of use of steroids is quite low. However, what we see in patient 13 and 14 is slightly different. So we see an initial long period here and here of steroids, um, and then the steroids are stopped, and then the steroids are restarted here and here. So that's something else is going on there, not quite sure. Um, but that can be quite a long time for a patient to be on steroids. And in this second case of, of patient 14, they had to be started on a, a second drug, which um, was also true, that was an immune uh, immunosuppressant as opposed to uh, at the same time as a steroid. In terms of long-term safety, we have the risk of integration, which is um, a consideration, uh, and we have the uh, a risk of potential um, cancer uh, long term. But it's so far out and we have such little data that it's, um, it'll always be a, a ponderable for the next five, 10, or maybe 15 years. In terms of factor activity level, um, this one to me is, is quite interesting and this is primarily around the assays. Um, so if you get, um, what's, there's two different types of assays or ways to measure your factor level. Um, and if you have a one stage with gene therapy, they're about 1.6 times higher the results than a chromogenic. Is that comparable to current factor? Well, actually, in a one stage assay, it's less than the chromogenic for um, the factor that you're currently taking. So, what if somebody says you've got, um, you know, a 10% or sorry, a 100% level? and a 60% level, well, it's both normal, so it's uh, effectively okay. If somebody says you have a 15% level and a 7% level, that potentially could, could be quite different. But this is something that we do need to monitor and we do need to understand going forward. Now, I hadn't talked about quality of life at all up to this point. I think that is a really important component. So in terms of the uh, data, this is just two of the uh, trials and most of them have, have seen the same sort of responses. Um, in the uh, treated bleeds um, or on the, uh, the biomarin, 95% reduction in bleeds over the um, four years of data that they have in the higher dose and 93 in the lower dose. Spark is pretty much showing something showing something quite similar with 91% reduction in bleeding rate. And more or less, the, the same thing is happening in, in all the trials, with a significant reduction in factor consumption, a huge reduction in factor consumption uh, across the board. So people generally can come off prophylaxis, very few spontaneous bleeds, and often it's, it's kind of traumatic uh, treatment or a surgery or dental uh, procedure that is required. So something along those lines. And that's pretty, pretty important in terms of day-to-day -day life. And Brian will go into that in a bit more detail. So if, if all the trials are showing that, what are the quality of life measures showing? I'm, I'm a big fan of quality of life uh, measures. So all of them are showing significant difference, which is right. And it should show a significant difference. The actual measurable difference in terms of the way it's been reported is actually a little, is, is quite small. So if you think about you know, somebody who's currently on really good um, prophylaxis, has been for a number of years, very minimal damage since they started that prophylaxis, whether you're an adult or you're a child who's always been on prophylaxis, your quality of life on a measurable scale is about 0.9. The general population without uh, a bleeding disorder is about 0.93. So you're jumping from 0.9 to 0.93, which for you as an individual could be huge and that's something we need to work on but as a measurable it doesn't come out uh, in that way which may affect uh, it, the the assessments of costs which is important um now i say that that measurable difference is small with a question mark because on the right hand side is, is jack he's just done a um an npr uh 
interview that's really interesting um and he's saying that you know he's he's no longer worried about uh, hemophilia he doesn't have to worry about his ankles they're not sore anymore he's moving around he's he's just um he, he would never go back um and that is something that uh, he's delighted with so and i think we're seeing some of some of the same impact from uh, patients or across uh, across the gene therapy trials, um, irrelevant of what trial it is. But the decision to go on it is quite complicated. Um, I think one of the things that we need to ask is, is uh, do we want protection from spontaneous bleeds, which we currently have? But some of the earlier trials, once you get over 5%, you have that protection from, from, some, from some or most spontaneous bleeds. Do you want long-term protection from joint deterioration? Well, we have a denual paper which says that you know, running around or running for a bus or those sorts of things, those sort of small traumas cause subclinical bleeding and over 12% would probably protect against that. Or do you want to protect um, against surgery or severe trauma? Completely no worries. And that's greater than 40% uh, of a factor level. Age is a consideration. You know, if you have a 40% factor level or a 50 or a 60% factor level, it is normal, but then you are readjusting to a normal population and cardiovascular risk might be um, a problem. Um, so if you, if you bring that down, that's, that's slightly different. So the risk benefit for me was like, or in terms of thinking about it is like, would you choose a 5% level for life with stiff ankles and some pain that you can't turn off? over a subcut every two weeks that gives you potentially twice the amount of protection in terms of 11% um, trough, not quite sure. Uh, would you choose a 5% level for 10 years over a 40% level for four years? Um, and that may be important if you're a young man who wants to travel or um, you uh, are older in, and, and you just want to stop and you have poor venous access. In terms of the remaining considerations, so we have a pediatric population, so um, a growing liver, um, that should be a loss of expression, I suppose loss of integration, apologies. But there are plenty of options here. Um, there's an option of lentivirus, but that is an integrating virus. And I said earlier on, we don't necessarily want that, so feelings are quite unsure about that. Sanofi and uh, Sagami from uh, China are, are looking into that. We also have the option of gene editing, uh, Novo Nordisk and Bluebird Bio, and that's effectively going in and assessing the, um, fixing the gene that is, uh, that is not working. History of an inhibitor, current inhibitor. Um, so will gene therapy be seen by the immune system as, uh, so will the factor eight or factor nine being produced in uh, a person with an inhibitor as a foreign, um, factor eight or factor nine, which is kind of as it sees it now, or will it see it as a self uh, protein where you're producing it yourself? There's two options that are available there. So you can go through the problem. So that's the Spark um, SPK8016 that, that I mentioned. And that effectively says, let's just try factor eight and see what happens. Um, or you can go around the problem, which is a Unicurist AMT180, which uses a factor nine, uh, sorry, an activated factor nine to treat patients with factor eight deficiency. It's really clever. I've talked about it uh, in some of the inhibitor sessions and I, I, I can explain that later if you want. In terms of uh, immunity um, and or redosing, for me, there, the, the response is effectively the same. We still have to get over that initial um, set of antibodies um, to give the treatment. Uh, we've seen some studies where over 50% of people have AAV antibodies. Um, in terms of our options there, we can use a different viral vector, such as lentivirus. Uh, we've seen the development of, of, of non-viral vectors, which are a little bit more difficult, uh, called liposomal or liposome nanoparticles. I just like the name, I think it's very cool. Um, or you can knock down or knock out the immune system for a short period of, of time by plasmapheresis, or something that we would see more in lines that you might use in um, uh, transplants for bone marrow or something, something along those lines. Um, for von Willebrand's or rare bleeding disorders, the lentivirus offers a much bigger capsid, so you can fit the DNA, like a bigger um, DNA cassette into it, but you still can probably fit all of the von Willebrand's gene into it, but you might be able to fit parts of it in, um, and this was Peter Lenting's talk at ISTH this year, and he postulated that you could use part of the gene to give some expression um, that could be quite useful. 
In terms of rare bleeding disorders, I said I'd come back to the AMT60 uh, discussion. So this was really interesting in terms of the study switch from AMT60 to AMT61. So effectively, that sets a precedent saying, in my mind at least, that we're, it's the same vector and it's a different DNA cassette and therefore you can, you can move forward at a slightly quicker pace. And that might be a really good option for many scenarios where we don't have big numbers and uh, the cost of a, of a gene therapy trial could be very, very large. And that might provide an opportunity for people with rare bleeding disorders to, um, to actually get access to gene therapy uh, in a faster uh, and, and, and also safe way. Or, and I say this, uh, bearing in mind that you've listened to me for the last what, 15, 20 minutes, you could forget all of that and think about cell-based therapies. So these are, cell, these are very interesting in terms of, they were developed from islet cells, primarily for diabetes. Um, the company itself are looking into factor eight, factor nine, factor seven. And effectively what you do is you take the, you take the factor eight cell that produces the factor, factor eight, you put it inside this sphere, this outside cover over here protects um, the cells from the body, and then you put the, uh, the sphere into the individual, and they produce the factor eight or the hormone or whatever is needed, and the antibodies can't get to it, and the um, innate immune system can't attack the cells. It's dose dependent, so you put in a cell, you get a response. Or, sorry, you put in a sphere, you get, you get a, a specific response. It's not permanent, um, so if there's a problem, you can take them out. And it's redosable, so um, after a while, if you lose expression, uh, you can redose. So that is another alternative in the cell-based therapies, which are slightly different to the gene therapies. So in terms of conclusions, there was a time when I looked like this, and Brian also looked like that, um, where we said gene therapy was going to be five years away. I don't know who I'm trying to embarrass with that picture. I, I, I completely lost uh, concept. But for the first time, gene therapy could be available this year um, in the US and probably early next year, next year in, in Europe. It offers a totally different landscape uh, for people with hemophilia. Um, almost uh, no bleeds, um, no use of prophylaxis, better protection levels, um, better protection from much higher levels in terms of, of your joints for, for the longer period of time. Um, and a significantly improved quality of life, whatever way um, you want to define that. And Brian, Brian will talk then to that a bit more detail. But it's not an easy decision. Um, there's a lot of considerations. Um, and we have to be cognizant that we, are, we can compare it to the current therapies, but we also need to compare it to the future therapies. And I think that's where Brian will probably get into it in a bit more detail. Thank you very much. And I'll give the Brian over to Brian. Does anybody have any clarification questions for Declan before I do my piece? Or do we want to take all the questions at the end? Okay, thank you, Declan. So I'll try and share my screen here. Do not, yes. Okay, can you see that okay? Okay, good. Yeah. Right, so I want to talk about some of, you know, taking in, into consideration all the science and all the, the advances Declan has talked about, what kind of concerns and would people have, what expectations and what decision drivers, what, what criteria should you look at when making a decision, when considering gene therapy? So obviously it's, it's, the clinical trials have demonstrated that a single infusion of an adeno-associated viral vector containing the DNA for either factor eight or factor nine can result in high protein expression levels, long-term durable factor expression, dramatic reduction in spontaneous traumatic bleeds over 90%, a dramatic reduction in requirement for factor and people being able to stop prophylaxis. When the clinical trials were starting, when they were underway, a lot of the regulators like the FDA, and EMA, and the companies themselves were looking at the annual bleed rate as the main outcome that we'd all be interested in. Um, uh, and, think, and of course, it, it, that's not the case, because if you look at 
uh, when we all went from on-demand to prophylaxis, the annual bleed rates fell. And then when he went on to prophylaxis with extended half-life factor, they fell again. And then if you look at therapies like Hemnebra, you got a very low annual bleed rate. So at the moment, you know, it's not unusual to have an annual bleed rate of zero, one, or two with current therapies. So in that's, if that's the main outcome you're looking for, why would anybody look at gene therapy if you're only looking at annual bleed rate? That's already been solved. And in fact, uh, what they did was a, a process called Coheme. They got together about 55 people, including patient leaders, leading clinicians, scientists, gene therapy companies, and payers. And we came up with a whole list of the, the we went through this long process over about a year and came up with six outcomes that were important for gene therapy. The level of factor expression. What factor level will we end up with afterwards? How long will it last, the duration of expression? What impact will it have on chronic pain? So the kind of chronic pain you get in joints. What about healthcare resource utilization? That's a nice phrase for saying, what will it cost? How much resources will it consume? The impact on the mental health of the person with hemophilia. And that actually, that one was rated highly by the people with hemophilia in the process. And the annual bleed rate just about made it into the top six at number six. And of those six, uh, many of us believe that the most important was the level of factor expression, followed by duration of expression. So they're the main outcomes, I think, to keep in mind. Uh, there are a lot of unmet needs in haemophilia. I won't go through this. And concern. So, okay, if, if you're talking about now, you've got, to, you've got to make a difference here between somebody going on a gene therapy clinical trial, which is a non-licensed therapy, and then somebody taking a licensed gene therapy. As Declan said, we're almost certainly going to have a licensed factor eight gene therapy probably next month in the USA and later this year, early next year in Europe. So let's, let's look at a situation where uh, gene therapy may be an option in the coming couple of years uh, in countries like Ireland. So what concerns would people have? With people with hemophilia. First of all, what if it doesn't work? You might get limited expression or no expression. Your factor level doesn't change or it goes up very little. What if you get an immune response? So typically, when, when you give, if you give an AAV, a viral vector, and it, it goes into the liver, it's quite natural if you think about it for the liver to see this as a foreign uh, invasion and to, to promote an immune response, as Declan said. Uh, and that inflammation in the liver then releases liver enzymes called transaminases, AST and ALT. And they're very carefully monitored in the gene therapy. What if you miss that? Like in some of the clinical trials, they're monitored either once a week or twice a week, or in some trials, three times a week initially for the first couple of months. If you miss that increase in, in, in liver enzymes, what it might mean is that this bit of inflammation might actually knock out any expression that you have. So that's a concern. So even if the gene therapy works, if you don't carefully monitor the liver enzymes, especially in the initial months, then you may get liver, um, you may get liver inflammation and lose the factor of expression that you've gained. A wide variability in expression is not predictable. Declan pointed out, you know, two, uh, two range, two times range, up to a seven or 10 times range, depending on the trial. So you might see some people in the trial getting 10%, some people getting 100 the problem is you can't predict beforehand who will get what level. The duration of expression may be limited. I think ideally you'd want a lifetime. Would you want at least 10 years? So there's no guarantee of how long it will last. Again, it seems at this point that the factor 9 gene therapy looks like it's lasting longer than the factor 8. That's, not, that's actually not a major surprise because the liver makes factor 9. The liver doesn't routinely make factor 8. It's a bigger ask of the liver. And then the long-term risk of cancer due to insertion and mutagenesis. So uh, Declan pointed out that the AAV vector is non-integrated. That means that the vector, the, the, the viral vector does not integrate, the, the DNA that goes into your liver cells does not integrate into your own DNA. So in other words, uh, even if, you're, if you get a higher factor level, that higher factor level will not transmit to the next generation. So if you have a daughter who's a carrier, that won't impact at the next generation. So it doesn't integrate into your own DNA. Um, we always said it was non-integrating. Now you'll hear people saying it's primarily non-integrating, but some integration does occur. We've seen that in canine models, but there's also a growing evidence and I think a growing consensus 
that some uh, integration does occur. It may be a very, very small amount of integration, but you're talking a very, very small amount from a very, very high dose. So if I, if I put it in perspective, if you look at the, uh, the BioMarin Factor 8 gene therapy trial, uh, the, at the, the highest dose of six by 10 to the 13 vector genomes per kilogram, that the dose given to an individual who's 70 kilograms would be 4.2 quadrillion vector genomes. Now, if you say that that is 99.999% non-integrating, that you only get 1,000th of 1% integrating, that's still 4.2 billion vector genomes. So, you know, I think there is a small amount of integration going on. What we don't know is where that's integrating and how important that is. It's important to say to date, there haven't been any cancers in humans treated with, uh, with gene therapies, but as I said, this is going to be a long-term uh, process of, of following up for 10, 15, 20 years. The expression may be too high. So, you know, on the one hand, you might get limited or no expression. On the other hand, you, you might get expression that's so high that you have a thrombosis risk, that you go from having a bleeding condition to a thrombosis condition. Uh, and in factor eight, we have seen some uh, expressions over 200%, which then fell. In factor nine, we've also seen expressions over 200%, which fell. But there was one single expression, which at one point, due to steroids, went up to 520%. Now that individual has now come way down to 250. But still, we have seen some high expressions. Economically, uh, you may not have access to gene therapy due to the cost or the requirement in some countries for co-payment. Uh, the the uh, suggested cost in the USA from what we've seen so far for factor eight gene therapy when it's licensed there may be somewhere between two to four million dollars per patient. Now that's the American market. That would not be the kind of cost we'd be looking at in Europe. We'd also be looking at different cost models of paying over a number of years. Now, what I'm going to say, it's not a slam dunk. You can't assume that gene therapy when it's licensed will automatically be available. We're going to have to do a lot of work on that. And indeed, we've already started doing that work. There was also a recent report of two deaths in the gene therapy trial in another condition. Now, there haven't been any deaths of a person with hemophilia, uh, but this was a very serious condition in childhood called X-linked myotubular myopathy. And what's notable here is that they gave them a very high dose. It was in the order of 10 to the 14, three by 10 to the 14 which is five times higher than the highest dose in any gene therapy clinical trial for hemophilia. Also, they treated young children, whereas in, in hemophilia, you only treat adults. Um, and, and a lot of these children have pre-existing liver disease. Now, the, the reason that they, you might think, well, that, that sounds very risky. Yes, it is very risky, but this is a horrible condition. And without, without gene therapy, 25% of the children will die in their first year of life and a four to 10% every year after that. So you can see here that the risk benefit ratio is entirely different to hemophilia. In fact, as Declan said, you do not currently treat children with hemophilia with gene therapy uh, because uh, their, their liver is still growing. So you might have to give a very large dose uh, and you wouldn't take the risk. Uh, but yet, you know, in, in Ireland, we have treated children with spinal muscular atrophy with gene therapy. And again, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as X-linked my tubular myopathy. These are very severe conditions. There are no other treatment options. So it's a risk benefit ratio is different. So this, this I, I'm not putting up the slide to, to make people very worried. I'm just pointing out that, you know, there are risks and you, you always have to be cognizant of this. And these were very high doses in very small children. Concerns, the impact of vector shedding. So obviously when you, when you get a high dose of vector, it is shed uh, in, in all of your body fluids, and it would be possible to infect family members. So that's, that's quite unlikely. Uh, it's an irreversible therapy. So unlike any therapy up to this point in time for hemophilia, you can't change your mind. Once you've had gene therapy, that's it. It's irreversible. It's not coming back out. Uh, if you don't achieve reasonable factor expression, so you don't get a reasonable factor level, and if you don't get a factor level for a reasonable length of time, you may have used up your one opportunity because, um, you know, a lot of people cannot actually have gene therapy at all at the moment with the existing vectors because they're pre-existing antibodies. But once, if you don't have a pre-existing antibody, once you get injected with the gene therapy, you immediately develop a high titer antibody. So you can't be retreated with the same vector. You can't be redosed. Um, and it's, it's very likely that you won't be able to be redosed with any other AAV-based 
a gene therapy vector because there's a lot of cross reactivity. What that means, and I think Declan explained it earlier, is there are several subtypes of AAV. So you might think, okay, well, if I get treated with one and I, I lose that expression, I need to be retreated, can they not treat me with another type? It's possible, but improbable because the antibody that you form to one may act to prevent any of the others from working. So at the moment, you can't redose. At the moment, you can't retreat. And even if you could retreat, it may not be economically viable. If it's going to be a very expensive therapy, a government may say, okay, we'll pay for this once, but you don't get a second shot at this. This was from an EHC conference in 2017. And this was interesting. It was a small group of people, 40 people. But there was a, um, they were asked about this before they had a session on gene therapy. So it's an interesting snapshot from three years ago of what people's concerns were. And over half of them had a fear of adverse events but most of them didn't know what they were. Seven were worried about cancer. Uh, two were worried about gene therapy increasing the risk of inhibitor reduction, causing inhibitors. Three were worried about infertility, and I'm not sure where that came from, because that's certainly not a risk. And, and two were concerned that it was an irreversible therapy. And despite these concerns, of the 35 who answered the next question, do you think your life would be better in the future with gene therapy? 30 said yes. So you can see there's a lot of hope being pinned on gene therapy despite some concerns. Then expectations. So what are the expectations from gene therapy? Well, they have moved on. They have changed. The, the slide in blue is from a lecture I gave at the UK annual conference in 2006. And at that stage, we were talking about longer acting factors coming down the, the line being available in the future, and also gene therapy. And at that time, we felt that the, the option in the future would be gene therapy would be an annual injection. Gene therapy once a year. Um, and by, by 2014, six years ago, it was felt that if you had an annual stable factor expression of 5%, that was seen as a good outcome. And the earlier factor nine trials that Deccan talked about from London, where they basically had between two to 5% were seen as a very good outcome. Now in 2020, 5% uh, is no longer seen as, as a good outcome. Um, at, at the WH round table last year, I surveyed all of the people with hemophilia who were present and I asked them, okay, if you were to get gene therapy, what ideal factor expression would you like? And most of them said between 50 and 100%. They wanted a life without the need for factor. 5% uh, would now be generally viewed as not acceptable. And, but the minimum acceptable, again, to many of them would be somewhere between 15 and 20%. At level of 15 to 20%, you'd have mild hemophilia, you wouldn't expect to be getting any spontaneous bleeds. In fact, you'd expect to be getting very few bleeds. Um, many, most felt that the ideal factor expression should be over 50%, at least 20 to 40%. And if you couldn't have a life without factor, then certainly where a life where you'd only need factor for major trauma or surgery. Now for older people with hemophilia, there might be a slightly lower uh, level required because oddly enough, the, the fact that you have severe hemophilia gives you some cardioprotective effect because you're, you're unlikely to get a a cardiac arrest caused by a clot. So you want to maintain some of that protection from, from, from cardiac disease that hemophilia um, gives you. So here's a question for you. And if you'd please, each of you would respond on the chat. This is question one. So pick A, B, C, D, or E. So if you were, if you were to be treated with, fact, with gene therapy, and if they could say to you, okay, look, um, that the fact you're likely to achieve a factor level of A, 5%, B, 15 to 20%, C, 20 to 40%, D, 50 to 100%, or E, 50 to 150%, which one would you choose? So if each of you wouldn't mind uh, voting now on the chat, pick A, B, C, D, or E, the factor level that you would accept. Have you all voted? I'll move on. Okay. No, of course, that, that would be a very nice question to be asked. As well, Declan pointed out earlier, not only is there great variability, but you can't predict. So they can't tell you. You can't, it's not like a menu you can't choose. But it'd be interesting to see what people's expectation would be. So expectation of duration of expression. So again, if you're considering gene therapy, 
would you want it to last a lifetime, at least 10 years, five to 10 years? And I think in many developed countries, less than five to 10 years would not be viewed as acceptable. Um, but you could perhaps have an expectation that after five to 10 years, the, the fact that you can't currently be retreated, that problem should be sol solvable and may well be solved within five to 10 years, allowing for retreatment with either the same vector or a different vector. So again, I'm going to ask you a second question. This is the last one I'll be asking you. So if you were going to get gene therapy, what duration of expression will persuade you to be treated with gene therapy? A, five years. B, five to eight years. C, 10 years. D, a lifetime. If you'd take a minute to answer that. Okay. Right, uh, and again, expectations. So you would, ex that be, you would have an expectation that if you get a constant significant factor expression, that should result in a decrease in chronic pain, um, in improvement in damaged joints over time due to less subclinical bleeding. It's, it's certainly been seen from the use of uh, extended half-life factors, aggressive prophylaxis, heme libra, that um, for many people, some of the joint pain that they always assumed was arthritis was actually subclinical bleeds, a very small bleeds, not rising to the level where you'd need to take treatment, but still causing some pain and damage. So you'd expect to see a decrease in chronic pain and an improvement in some of your damaged joints. The ability to do normal activities taken for granted by those without hemophilia, like working, walking, cycling, swimming, running, more sports, an opportunity to lead a more active and balanced lifestyle. Uh, the freedom to constant, from constantly having to consider your hemophilia. And I think all of us consider hemophilia quite a lot in our day, even if you don't think you are. You know, linking your prophylaxis days or your times to your physical activities. Oh, on Tuesday, I'm going to be doing this. So oh, I better, no, I better leave that until Wednesday because that's my profi day. The need to respond immediately to trauma, requirement to plan your activities, requirement to bring factor with you when you're traveling and to be aware of the nearest treatment centers. And actually something we're seeing more and more uh, as an issue is we're an enhanced ability to walk or live abroad for a period of time. We're getting lots of young men now with hemophilia who want to live in Australia or Canada or somewhere else for a couple of years and they're finding that having severe hemophilia is a barrier to being allowed by those governments to stay there because they'd be seen as an economic burden on the healthcare system. And in fact, if they're treated with gene therapy in the future, that may well no longer be a barrier. But managing expectations, it's not a genetic cure. So, you know, gene therapy will not wipe out hemophilia in a family. It just affects the individual. But it may be a phenotypic or functional cure. So it still means you have hemophilia. You still have that mutation in your X chromosome. Um, and you will still pass that mutation on to a daughter who will be a carrier. But it, it may be a functional cure. If you get a sufficiently high factor level, it could well put you in the normal range, which will give you a functional cure. It won't reverse existing serious joint damage. So if you've got severe joint damage that's pre-existing, it's not going to reverse that. And it won't make you more active or get you off the couch. It should facilitate that, but you actually have to get up off the couch. It won't magically make you more active. You actually still have to do the work. And it doesn't mean you can only take very risky activities with total impunity. So boxing, rugby, you know, these are still not a good idea, even with gene therapy. Now, in terms of the mental health impact, um, it may lead to a reduction in anxiety or depression. And Declan and I have been involved in a lot of studies over the year looking at quality of life and hemophilia. And interestingly enough, a significant proportion of hemophilia when they're surveyed on quality of life will report a level of anxiety or depression. Um, so it may lead to a reduction in that. It may lead to positive feelings of joy, ease of living, maybe a new outlook on life. But we've also seen in some clinical trials uh, and surprised by this initiative when I saw the initial reports, that some people may need emotional support uh, to deal with feelings of loss of identity or community, uncertainty or loss of past opportunity. Um, and the uncertainty I can certainly uh, believe because you don't know how long the gene therapy will last, you don't know how long the factor level will last, you don't know what the long-term safety implications. So there are uncertainties. Feelings of loss of identity or community, this was reported by some people primarily in the USA 
And I'm wondering if some of those people didn't cut themselves off from their chapter or their haemophilia organization or other people they knew with haemophilia, if they kind of self-imposed themselves away from the community, which isn't uh, a requirement and we'd never do that, but it's, it, it struck, struck me as being slightly strange. The loss of past opportunity is a, is, a, is a strange one again. And this came home to me when somebody uh, from uh, Europe who switched to Heme Libra and uh, had several months with no bleeds and felt much better and a lot of his chronic pain uh, went away, then started feeling quite low because he thought, I've gone through 50 years of life without this quality of life. Look at all I've missed out on. So it's kind of regretting the years that you didn't have that good quality of life. That's what they call loss of past opportunity. A strange concept, but I think, I think there is the need for looking at this very carefully as we go on. And indeed, there's a whole new core heme outcomes process now defining the parameters for the psychological health of people pre and post gene therapy. So the unmet needs. So you've looked at the concerns and the expectations you might have. So what are the unmet needs that might lead you to looking at criteria for gene therapy? Well, the intrusiveness of chronic therapies. How much does current hemophilia treatment intrude in your life? The requirement to be aware of peaks and troughs. Um, joint damage and the physical challenges that come with hemophilia. Worry, anxiety, depression, the mental health impact. The disability paradox, where people with hemophilia overestimate the health-related quality of life, typically by 17%. A recent study has shown that. So, I mean, there is that if you took... If you took a group of adult men with haemophilia uh, and you asked them to fill out a quality of life uh, survey and you took uh, a group of people without haemophilia of the same age and gave them the joints of the people with haemophilia, the people without haemophilia would report a much lower quality of life. Um, what happens is people with haemophilia get used to a certain amount of joint damage, a certain amount of joint pain, and they, they normalize that. So they actually report a higher quality of life than you would expect them to report given the, the condition of their joints, which is very good. It shows very good coping mechanism. It's not very helpful when it comes to trying to pay for therapies because it looks as if the quality of life is already quite high. And then the other thing is loss of work productivity and social inclusion caused by haemophilia. Um, the, the main decision driver may well be your experience of living with haemophilia. Uh, what's your annual bleed rate? What kind of, do you bleed a lot or do you bleed little? Some people with haemophilia even with severe hemophilia, bleed very little. Some people with, with moderate hemophilia bleed a lot. The existing state of your joints, your current activity levels, and your, the barriers you have to increased activity. And some of the barriers can be not just physical. They can be psychological in terms of, I worry if I do this, this will happen. Needle phobia or poor venous access. And the fatigue of living with severe hemophilia. May wish to experience life without severe hemophilia. Um, it also depends on the existing treatments available to you. So in Ireland, we have, we now all have, um, a country may have standard or extended half-life recombinant. In Ireland, everybody is either extended half-life recombinant or heme libra as options. Um, I think heme libra in fact rate deficiency, the availability of heme libra, in my view, may well lead to a slower uptake for factor eight gene therapy in some people with hemophilia. They might take a wait and see attitude because they might think, okay, um, that's now if, if I want to switch from factor, that's a good option, and I can switch to that maybe, and, and that could give me a good quality of life. And I can wait and see, so they could take a wait and see attitude. What about the impact of other as yet unlicensed novel therapies? You got Pituceran, the anti TFBIs, and the spheres and other therapies that Declan mentioned. Um, and I think people with hemophilia who are on prophylaxis with either extended half life or emicizumab would carefully weigh the additional benefits and risks of gene therapy. Uh, and people in developing countries, on the other hand, so if you look at our, our twin country in Vietnam, for example, when we twinned with Vietnam for several years, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, we persuaded one of the gene therapy companies to extend the clinical trial for gene therapy to Vietnam. Now, if you're in Vietnam and your current treatment is cryoprecipitate or plasma, and you get the option of gene therapy, now that's a big difference from your current therapy. So the, the jump to them from plasma or cryo to gene therapy is huge. The jump from extended half-life factor or heme libra is a big jump, but not, not as big. So the, your existing therapy is one of the factors to take into consideration. And then it depends on the age profile. Uh, the younger adults who may have good joints, gene therapy might maintain this. 
it might allow them to increase their quality of life and the possibility of having more activity, more life options, better, you know, different employment options or travel. Um, for young adults as well who are starting families, uh, family planning may impact, may impact on the timing and uptake of gene therapy because you really can't have a family for probably about a year at least after starting gene therapy. For older adults who may already have significant joint damage, gene therapy may offer improvement in chronic pain, in mobility, in the ability to be active with family and friends, and more freedom from thinking about haemophilia. And for children, children are the obvious target for gene therapy. If you think about it, the ideal candidate for gene therapy is a newborn child with severe haemophilia that you give, give them gene therapy that would last a lifetime, uh, and that's it. But of course, at the moment, uh, and that would allow them to avoid all joint damage. At the moment, um, you can't do that because um, it, their, their livers are too small, they're, they're growing. So any gene therapy you give them, they'd be losing as, as their liver grows. Uh, and the only way to get around that is either to give them an integrating vector, which has its own ethical problems, or giving them massive doses, which could cause problems. So I think um, that they are going to start trying gene therapy trials in children between the age of 18 and 15. I think they get down to 12 within the next five years, but I, it's, it's going to be slow going below the age of 12. And I think that requires significant scientific advances and a significant ethical debate. And I, I think, in fact, it may well be that, that gene editing might be the future for children uh, rather than gene therapy. Then you have the early adapters, the kind of guy who's first in line outside the shop when the new Apple iPhone comes out. He's there at nine o'clock next morning. So he wants to try the new thing. The early adapters, you'll always have early adapters. Then at the other end of the spectrum, they're very cautious. The person wants to wait and see for a significant time period. I won't take the option of gene therapy. I think a lot of people would be in the middle. They might wait, even if they're interested, they might wait a year or two to see what the real world experience is uh, of a licensed gene therapy. And I think that trend, as I said earlier, may be more apparent than people with factor eight deficiency due to the availability of emicizumab. And I think uptake will increase when there's real world evidence of safe, stable, predictable factor expression levels and agreement on which assay to use to measure expression. It's also, uh, it's also worthwhile remembering that uh, gene therapy is going to be licensed for severe hemophilia, not for mild or moderate. But even within severe, if you exclude the children with severe, if you exclude those with pre-existing antibodies to AAV, and if you exist those with a history of inhibitors, um, my own calculations on this were that that, that means that about 44% of those with severe factor eight deficiency or 48% of those with factor nine deficiency will be eligible. So over half the people already will, be not, will not be eligible for the current gene therapies. And I think, the, I hope that the one thing you will take away from, from this evening is if, you were go, if you're going to consider gene therapy and we'll be doing a lot of educational efforts and, and, and so on on this, there, nobody should consider gene therapy, nobody should be treated with gene therapy without going through a detailed informed consent process without asking all the questions and without, without asking them more than one time and being quite satisfied it, because it is an irreversible decision. And the kind of questions you should be asking at the moment, if it's a clinical trial, what trial should I participate in? What are the results from earlier phases of the trial? What's the reputation of the trial team? What vectors being used? And what percentage of the population will have pre-existing antibodies to that vector? Um, what, what strategies are coming up with to get rid of those pre-existing antibodies in the future? What dose is being infused? What's the anticipated range of factor expression? Um, is it worthwhile going for a higher dose if the objective is higher factor expression, but there may also be a, a bigger immune response? Um, am I comfortable taking a prophylactic dose of steroids if that's required? Uh, so I think there are a lot of questions, and that's only some of the questions, but there are many, many questions. And one of the things we'll be doing certainly over the coming months, uh, and before we consider any licensed gene therapy here, is producing publications and materials to make sure that any person with hemophilia in Ireland who's considering gene therapy uh, is all fair with all of this. There, there are a lot of issues to be considered. In terms of hemophilia gene therapy in Ireland, you'll be aware that we've been talking about this for at least five years. We've had companies over, we've had meetings in the office, people have come in and gone through processes of discussions and many people have been tested with various uh, vector antibodies. Uh, so th this, is, this has been ongoing for several years. Now, at this point, 
we actually have treated three people with factor IX gene therapy as part of a phase three clinical trial. So finally, this year, um, we treated the first three people uh, as part of a phase three clinical trial for factor IX deficiency. There's ongoing recruitment for another factor IX gene therapy clinical trial, and there's possible recruitment next year for a factor VIII gene therapy trial. And as Declan said, the first factor VIII gene therapy is expected to be licensed next month in the USA and in Europe by the end of this year or early next year. And the first factor IX will probably be licensed in about a year's time. Uh, this was the, uh, in, in, in early March, actually the week just before the AGM, we announced uh, in, in the media that we'd had the first gene therapy in a person with haemophilia in Ireland. And this was exciting. We'd been talking about this for several years um, and just getting